Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. It's official. China is winning the race to the moon. And don't give me that crap about how we already won the race to the moon. Arguing that is like arguing since Leif Erikson made it to America first. The United States should be called the United States of Norway. China is ahead in this race. Dangerously ahead. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Bulletin. I have not talked about the People's Republic of China for quite some time, except in passing when I talk about why we need to get to the moon as rapidly as possible. When I say we, I'm talking uh, the United States, Europe, Canada, all the members and signatory nations of the Artemis Accords, and what China's intentions are for the moon. All of that having been said, though, recently I've noticed that uh, there have been quite a number of comments on the Chang'e 6 mission that just happened recently, a sample return mission from the moon where people are posting things like congratulations to our Chinese comrades, well done, etc. I need to make one thing abundantly clear. The Chinese are not our comrades. It's great. It's fine to congratulate the Chinese, in my opinion, on their accomplishments, certainly. But we always need to keep in mind that they are deadly rivals. And yeah, that may sound a bit dramatic, but it's very true. Because China and NASA and ESA have not been collaborators for a very long period of time. Ever since the late 1990s, when it became abundantly clear that China was stealing top-secret proprietary technologies from the West in a high-profile accident that took place uh, with a number of high-profile American customers on a rocket that was launched from China, and then shortly thereafter, the technologies that were on those payloads were suddenly being used by the Chinese miraculously. Well, it was very apparent that China was willing to steal whatever technology that their Western customers had on board, much of the same as they would take any technology from a Chinese customer, even though it was very clear that they weren't supposed to be doing that sort of thing. And ever since then, the United States has barred China from the International Space Station. It's very, very clear that China is not going to respect the proprietary technology, the secret and private nature of a certain number of technologies that are in use aboard the International Space Station, some of the payloads that are delivered to NASA for experimentation are extremely secretive that the astronauts who are authorized to work on these payloads have very strict non-disclosure agreements and they are not going to reveal any details of the equipment and their technology that they're working with and up to this point as near as we can tell Russia has been extremely respectful of that as well. Nobody steals secrets and technology from each other on the ISS. And the reason that the Chinese Space Agency, the CNSA, Chinese National Space Agency, doesn't behave in the same way as Roscosmos does is because of the fact, at least in my opinion, that they are a military institution. Unlike Roscosmos, unlike the space agencies of virtually every nation on the planet, the CNSA is nothing more than another branch of the Chinese military, just like their army, their navy, their air force, and of course, all of these divisions have their own intelligence agencies, and you can bet that the CNSA also has its own intelligence agency dedicated to taking what ever technology and whatever knowledge that they can gather that will be a strategic advantage to China in the future. Therefore, NASA and ESA, for that matter, dare not include China on any of these high-profile missions on the International Space Station. 
Consequently, China, as we all know, has built their own space station. They're going it alone, which is fine. I totally understand. But they're doing that not necessarily because that's what they've wanted to do all along. They're doing it because they have no choice because of their prior behavior. And now China is setting about getting to the moon before the West does. And given their behavior in the South China Sea and other places where they set up bases, where they build artificial islands, essentially unsinkable aircraft carriers, where they build their military presence, there is little doubt in my mind that China is going to be just as jealously protective of any territory around any landing site where they establish a presence, meaning that if they reach the lunar south pole before NASA does, they are going to lay claim to the best real estate at the lunar south pole. And let me tell you, there isn't a whole lot of that. There aren't a whole lot of places where there's water ice. There aren't a whole lot of choices landing locations at the Lunar South Pole. It's a very rugged area, an area that's going to be a lot more challenging to set down on than at any of the Apollo landing sites. So yeah, it's rather critical that NASA and ESA and all the Artemis signatory nations managed to make it to the moon before China and now their Russian allies. But, I mean, do we really have anything to worry about here? I mean, SLS is now orbited the moon, or rather Orion, propelled by SLS, has orbited the moon, and China is nowhere near to the point to where they can send a human-rated spacecraft even to lunar orbit, let alone to the surface of the moon. So doesn't NASA have an insurmountable lead? Well, as you're about to see, absolutely not. China has achieved a number of extremely important milestones in their endeavor to beat the West to the moon. And as of right now, China not only has a lead, they have a dangerous lead. Since the beginning of the century, over a decade before Artemis was even a thing, China had a five-stage plan for putting humans on the moon and for exploiting lunar resources. So yeah, China's been at this for quite some time. It started with their orbital robotic missions back in 2007. The Chang'e 1 and the Chang'e 2 orbited the moon in 2007 and 2010 respectively. And it wasn't long after that that China started to land on the moon and targeted a very interesting region of the moon that they knew they could exploit for a future lunar base. China's been at this for quite some time. The Chang'e 3 launched on December 2nd, 2013 and landed on the moon on the 14th of December 2013 and carried a lunar rover named U2, which explored an area of approximately three square kilometers, and it was supposed to be carrying out a wide variety of ultraviolet observations of galaxies and variable stars, binaries, etc. In other words, deep space astronomy, supposedly. But the emphasis of China's lunar exploration became a lot more clear when Chang'e 4 was launched on December 7th, 2018. Now, this was originally supposed to fly in 2015 as a backup for the Chang'e 3, but given how successful Chang'e 3 was, the configuration of Chang'e 4 was changed. And on January 3rd, 2019, China became the first nation to land in the South Pole Aiken Basin on the far side of the moon, and it deployed the U-2-2 rover. So China had already landed in the Lunar South Pole region in 2019 before India even did it with the Chandrayaan-2 and their emphasis was very clear and we'll see why in just a moment. On November 23rd, 2020, Phase 3, the sample return missions of this plan, went into action. The Chang'e 5 landed near the Mons Rumkin base on the moon on December 1st, 2020, and returned to Earth with just over 1.7 kilograms worth of lunar samples back to Earth. So keep in mind what China has been able to accomplish up to this point. They had landed the Chang'e 3, 
the Chang'e 4, and the Chang'e 5. Three straight lunar probes without any mishaps, without any upside down landings, sideways landings, any of that nonsense. And not only that, by now, China was returning samples back to Earth. Not only were they landing on the moon, they were getting part of their spacecraft, at least, back to Earth from the moon. Which means, by the end of 2020, China had mastered, on a robotic level anyway, what was going to be necessary to put human beings on the surface of the moon and get them back safely. Something that the Artemis program has yet to accomplish. In fact, it's nowhere close to being able to accomplish that. There are no sample return missions in the near future for the Artemis program, no missions whatsoever that are going to be able to test our capability of landing on the moon and then returning payloads back to Earth. So this is why China has achieved a lead thus far. And by the way, after this mission was complete, it was very clear what China was up to because the samples that were returned by the Chang'e 5 probe were loaded with titanium. And this was something that China was happy to announce to the world, that the lunar regolith was loaded with incredibly valuable resources which could be used by industries on Earth. And incidentally, that's what the sample return phase of this program was designed to do, to determine what sort of lunar resources were available. And the Chang'e 6, which just landed recently and also lifted off recently with samples in tow, is just the next step in this process, except it landed on the South Pole Aiken Basin on the far side of the moon, which China has landed there before, and this time they deployed a rover to conduct infrared spectroscopy to determine what? Lunar composition to see what sort of resources that they can find. And then the Chang'e 7, expected to launch in 2026, will explore the South Pole for resources. This mission will include an orbiter, a lander, and a mini flying probe. And then Chang'e 8, which is expected to launch in 2028, will verify in situ resource development and utilization technologies. And the objective behind this is to set up a lunar robotic research station as a prelude to a human research station. And by the way, this station is supposed to be designed in cooperation with Roscosmos, who certainly doesn't have the capability of getting to the moon anytime soon. Soon, but definitely has a lot of experience in operating in space. In fact, more man hours in space than the United States does or any other nation. Collaborating with Russia is a very big plus for China's ambitions to colonize the moon. And by the way, this base comes complete with a one megawatt nuclear power station, 10 times as powerful as the nuclear station that NASA is planning to use for their future lunar base. What they want to use a full megawatt for is anybody's guess. Certainly a lot more power than what is necessary for a small research station. But all of this is fanciful CGI nonsense. I mean, in terms of actually sending a human-rated spacecraft to the moon, China is still very much behind, aren't they? The SLS and the Orion have already orbited the moon, and if all goes well in 2025, a crew of four astronauts will actually orbit the moon on the Orion. So why am I saying that China has a lead here? Well, for a very important reason. NASA has no clear plan, at least no plan that has a definite end date of building a human landing system that's going to be able to put human beings on the moon before 2030, and it may even take longer than that. Starship is obviously a highly complex system, a system that requires lots of logistics, lots of launches of the biggest rocket in human history, a rocket that has yet to to reuse or even land either the super heavy first stage or the Starship orbiter stage. And at least reusing the booster is going to be an absolute necessity to refuel Starship sufficiently to where it can put human beings on the moon. But here's China's plan.
Are you awake now? China is hard at work at testing a new 130-ton thrust engine, reusable by the way, that will be used on the Long March 10, a rocket that will carry not only a reusable Chinese spacecraft in the future, but also a short-term solution for putting Taikonauts on the lunar surface a lot faster. It's going to deploy both an orbiter, a lunar orbiter that is, and this orbiter orbiter is called the Mangzhou. It's essentially just a modified version of the orbiter that China currently uses for low Earth orbit missions. And then another Long March 10 will deploy the Longyue lander to an orbit around the moon. And then these spacecraft will rendezvous, transfer two Taikonauts over to the Longyue, and then the Longyue will set down on the lunar surface. And by the way, it's also capable of carrying a rover down to the surface of the moon, also a habitat, essentially the basics to get a lunar base started and for Taikonauts to explore the lunar south pole, at least to a limited extent, before a more ambitious landing can be carried out in the future. The reason this is advantageous is it doesn't require any sort of complicated logistics. It doesn't require 11 launches of the most powerful rocket in human history. It just requires two launches of an admittedly very big rocket that's going to be pretty damned expensive, but nevertheless, a solution that will get Taikonauts onto the surface of the moon very simply. Now, of course, we might wonder about the logistics and the challenge of rendezvousing two spacecraft in lunar orbit. That's not going to be an easy thing to do, especially if you don't have any experience with doing it. Or wait a minute. Maybe China does have experience with doing this. Indeed they have, because that's how they've managed to carry out these sample return missions. Once the samples lifted off from the lunar south pole, they rendezvoused with an orbiting spacecraft in lunar orbit, and that's the spacecraft that returned the samples to Earth. So actually, China has been doing dress rehearsals for this mission all along with robots, as a prelude to doing it with humans. And NASA was at least partially emulating this plan with the CLPS missions. However, up to this point, we haven't had a tremendous amount of success with these missions. I mean, China has set down on the moon several times now without any significant issues whatsoever. And we have had one complete failure with CLPS and one partial failure where the spacecraft barely managed to get its data back. In fact, it may not have gotten back all the data that it needed to. So really, when it comes down to it, China has demonstrated that they are far more comfortable with operating on the surface of the moon than NASA is. How these two ships managed to pass each other in the night is anybody's guess, and frankly, it really doesn't matter. It's just time to take this race seriously and try to catch up now before it's too late. Thank you very much for watching. Please keep in mind that I now have a date that I'm going to be heading to Shetland to cover the first ever orbital launch attempt, vertical launch attempt anyway, from Western Europe. I am very, very eager to go cover this historic event, but frankly, I still need your help. I'm not up to that 1% threshold on Patreon that I need in order to be able to fund these types of expeditions, so if you would like to help out, all the details are in the description, and if you're not able to help out, I totally understand. Just please make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and also, if possible, watch Watch all the ads on these videos for at least 30 seconds because that makes a very big difference as to how much compensation I get from YouTube, which frankly is getting pretty pathetic these days. Thanks again for watching and as always, stay angry about space.